So how does pyruvate dehydrogenase work? It's pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's the enzyme that takes pyruvate and transfers it to acetyl-CoA and NADH. Now depending on the textbook you read, it's going to say that this is either a three-step process or a four-step process. This uh, figure obviously has four steps, but the first step is decarboxylation. The second step is a reduction. The third step is an is an oxidation, and then the last step is to uh, oxidize the lipoamide to NADH. Now basically what we have going on is we've got this pyruvate molecule, and this uh, thymine pyrophosphate, is, uh, basically it, it's this CO2 molecule is cleaved right here, and thymine pyrophosphate replaces it, uh, adding an, an alcohol from a carbonyl, and then uh, the lipoamide replaces the thymine pyrophosphate and reforms the carbonyl. Um, the thymine pyrophosphate then can be recycled. Uh, at that point, the coenzyme A replaces the lipoamide, or you could call it lipoamide, I'm really not sure the exact pronunciation, uh, but that produces the acetyl-CoA in, in a reduced form of the lipoamide. And the reduced lipoamide then uh, combines with NAD to form an oxidized lipoamide and NADH. In a textbook that gives you three steps, it's going to tell you that the first step is decarboxylation. So that would be step one. And then the second step would be a combined oxidation or reduction oxidation all in one step. And actually, I should have circled so this. And I just circled the same thing. Um, this all would be one step for a three-step process. So that's reduction. This is oxidation. And then the last step would be the regeneration of lipoic acid. Now, you remember that pyruvate dehydrogenase under physiological conditions is irreversible. And the chemistry behind that is that typically whenever there's an oxidation going on, oxidations are very hard to reverse directly and so you have to go through another mechanism to reverse this reaction. And the last thing I'm going to say about this, if you're watching these videos in the order that I make them, you'll notice that this seems strangely out of place and that I made it directly after I made uh, a video on the electron transport chain. And because of that, I'll probably reorder this on my blog. Um, but uh, just know if you're watching in the order that I'm making them, the reason I'm doing it this way is I'm just following the flow of how things are going in the class. Now the largest energy stores, the largest energy store is fat. Number one is fat. Number two is amino acids. And the third would be glycogen. So glycogen is the lowest on these. So whenever you're producing pyruvate during the starvation state, most of that is coming from amino acids. Fat, except for odd chain fatty acids, fat cannot become pyruvate. So amino acids are the largest contributors to, are the main contributors to uh, gluconeogenesis. Of the amino acids, only leucine and lysine cannot become pyruvate. And the reason is because they become, they go directly to acetyl-CoA. CoA. So the contributors to gluconeogenesis, the contributors to gluconeogenesis are um, amino acids primarily, and then from the Cori cycle we get lactate. We get glycerol from the cleavage of triglycerides and uh, fructose. And then uh, some odd chain fatty acids, such as uh, uh, propionate. Now out of these, lactate and then alanine, so alanine from amino acids, these are the two primary gluconeogenic substrates. Primary.